YouTube as well. Um, the chat is enabled, so if you want to drop in the chat where you're joining us from, that would be fantastic. Well, now I had seen, because I had seen a set of sunglasses, I think it was sunglasses that were um, recording for like TikTok. Um, it, it was a, it was like meant to meant to connect with social media rather than um, work as a translator. But I'm really mm -hmm. I'm really interested in the language aspect. I think a lot of people, you know, you want to learn all the languages that exist. You understand that there are things mm -hmm. like dishes that need to be done, and there are constraints on your time that don't allow for that to happen. So. Um, yeah, yeah. That's uh, just yesterday. You know, someone uh, uh, trying to fix the our AC system told me that they really want to learn Chinese and Mandarin, but it's just uh, so hard for 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 him. And then if he has this, you know, AR glasses, then no worries, right? <laughs> we can we can talk in your talk. mother tongue, and you can understand others in their mother tongue. It's just fantastic. Yeah. I think that's wonderful. We have a lot of folks from St. Louis. Welcome. Washi folks, this is very exciting to see everybody. I'm sorry about that. Great. Well, I think it is time for us to start. Welcome, everybody. Uh, greetings. My name is Jonesy. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the administrative coordinator for the public health programs here at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, for those who are joining on YouTube, the comments are disabled, so we won't be able to take any of your questions. And if you are joining us here on the Zoom webinar, um, we can't see or hear the audience, but as many of you know, the chat is enabled, so please let us know where you're joining from. And if you have any questions during the presentation or have thoughts that you'd like to share, we invite you to share them in the chat as well. Um, my colleague Tiffany and I will be moderate, will monitor the chat to make sure that any questions that you have get to Dr. On so that he can answer them. Open Classroom is an initiative of the Brown School that began at the start of the pandemic. To date, we've had the chance to do nearly 200 programs, building a library of incredible free resources that are available to attend free of charge and to watch on the Brown School's YouTube page at any time after. Uh, we hope you'll keep an eye on our calendar for upcoming events, and we'll drop a link to that page in the chat in a bit. I am delighted to uh, introduce our final speaker for the spring semester, Dr. Rupeng An. Um, Dr. An is an associate professor here at Brown School. His research aims to develop a uh, well-rounded knowledge base and policy recommendations under the social ecological framework that can inform decision-making and social resource allocation in combating the obesity epidemic. He teaches courses in biostats, systematic review and meta-analysis, and more recently applied machine learning using health data. He has co-developed a post-master certificate for artificial intelligence applications for health data, for those of you who are finishing up your master's or who already have it, we'll drop a link in the chat where you can learn more. Um, and that begins on August 31st of this year, which is very exciting. And he is also working on an artificial intelligence and big data analytics certificate that will be available to the Brown School student community beginning in the spring of 2023. So please join me as we welcome Dr. On to our Zooms for his talk today, Artificial Intelligence Implications for Social Equity and and bias. Dr. Ahn, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Zhangzi and Tiffany. I really appreciate both of your fantastic support. And hello, everyone. Really nice to see all of you in the space. Uh, let me share the screen really quick. Can you see my presentation slides? Okay, good. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. And today I would like to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and its vast implications for social equity and bias, which is definitely a very uh, intriguing and also highly controversial topic. 
And instead of really you know, uh, doing a lecture type of approach, uh, so far, you know, no one actually uh, figured out you know, what are the solutions to those uh, potential implications and problems. So instead of you know, trying to provide you know, solutions, you know, which most likely are not going to be correct, uh, I'll use a different approach, basically providing you the cases, uh, the implications, so that you can have some food for thought for this uh, quickly evolving and highly complicated topic. So before we uh, really talk about the, the contents, I want to draw your attention and do some exercise. So here are some warm up questions for you. Uh, so first, please briefly comment on the following statement, wearing pajamas to a class. So if you can you know, write it in your chat, uh, we'll do think whether it is appropriate or it is not appropriate uh, or you know, what tag you want to give to this behavior. So let's take a look. So feel free to you know, just type and write in the chat box. Do you think it's appropriate behavior? It's not appropriate. It is you no know, ethical, non-ethical, or you no know, what kind of uh, tag you want to give. Uh, someone say, okay, so uh, undergrad appropriate, grad is not appropriate. <laughs> that, that's a good one. A little disrespectful, but part of college culture. Okay, great. So uh, you all get your own ideas uh, and not appropriate. Okay, great, great. Uh, appropriate college culture. I, I, I think I have to agree with you. you know, being a, a faculty member for over 10 years you know, in different universities, uh, I think, you know, I, uh, I think yeah, it, 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 it makes sense, right? It is a, a college culture. So, um, well, if you ask me, what is the machine is going to think about it? Uh, the machine tells you it is inappropriate. But then what is more exciting is to give a condition, right? Wearing pajamas to a class if pajamas is the only clothes I have. What do you think? Uh, do you think it's appropriate or inappropriate? And what do you think the machine is going to think about it? You can uh, keep writing in the chat, chat box. <laughs> Please wear pajamas, right? It's, it's better than not wearing anything. Right, only then, yes, appropriate, okay, yes, a necessity, <laughs> great, we see a lot of fantastic answers, and let's see whether the machine is going to be, be able to figure that out, okay, so the machine said it is okay, okay. so that is the, um, no, the, the status quo of uh, ethical standard a machine can get at this moment, and then I ask another question, right? So uh, ignoring a phone call from your friend who you just had a fight with, do you think it is appropriate, not appropriate? It is rude or not rude? It is, you no. Know, what kind of uh, thoughts you give on this? You, know, you can keep writing on the chat. Ignoring a phone call from your friend who you just had a fight with. wise to allow yourself some cooling off time, normal behavior, appropriate to allow you both some space, appropriate, great answers, <laughs> appropriate to cool off. Yes, yes, I agree with all of you. And let's see how uh, and, uh, something not appropriate, the other may be trying to apologize. Okay, we'll come to that. That's a, that's a great answer. So let's take a look. So the machine think that it is understandable. Okay, so that is the, uh, the, the machine algorithm, figure that out and give you a suggestion. It is understandable. But then I give a condition, right? Ignoring a phone call from your friend who you just had a fight with, but apologize to you immediately after that. So do you still want to ignore uh, his or her phone call or not? appropriate as long as you follow up soon after, right? Okay, okay. So let's see whether the machine can figure this out. This is a bit tricky, right? And the machine said it is rude. Okay, so basically if the friend already apologized to you after the fight, then you should you know, show your you no know, forgiveness, right? And if you keep ignoring the phone call, you know, uh, you are rude. Okay, so that is the machine standard. 
And that's the another one, right? Uh, this is also tricky. Mowing the lawn late at night. So what do you think? Is this appropriate? It is rude or it is acceptable? Rude, right? Inappropriate rude. Okay, so I'll use it rude. That's the how the machine is going to respond, okay? So the machine uh, agrees with all of you, it is rude. But then I add a condition, okay, to that's see whether the machine can figure it out. Mowing the lawn late at night if you live in the middle of nowhere. So what do you think? W would the machine be able to figure that out? And let's see, that's go for it. Okay, <laughs> I agree, yes, go for it. Strange but not rude if no one can hear. Yes, I agree. It is strange, right? Because I intentionally make it strange. Uh, so, but let's take a look. So the machine said, oops, the machine said it is okay. So the machine is pretty smart, right? It's figure out the appropriateness of a condition, uh, of a behavior based on the condition. And now that's the uh, even more interesting one, killing a bear if it is a fish. Do you think that is something appropriate uh, or not appropriate? Kidding a bear if it's a fish, that's the inappropriate, okay. Uh, no, not appropriate, okay. That may be a universal answer, right? No, because, well, how the bear is going to survive, it's going to eat something, right? And bear eating a fish uh, is, is, is something that that the bear should do. Uh, so uh, that's see, the machine said, no, uh, it is wrong, right? So you shouldn't kill a bear uh, just because it is a fish. But then no, I made my final trick, right? I really want to trick this machine to answer something that is not appropriate. So I changed this no, our sentence by one word, replacing the eats by tortures, killing a bear if it tortures a fish. Someone would guess no whether uh, the machine is going to figure that out. What is the answer of the machine? The answer is, is uh, Heidi mentioned no. <laughs> is a bear capable of torturing something? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so probably uh, definitely is not, the torturing is not in the dictionary of the bear, uh, is you know, a human being give it a definition, right? If the bear play with the fish, but not in the hurry of eating it, then, well, it probably, we can give a human tag of torturing, but let's see. Uh, so the machine this time said, it's okay, right? So you can kill a bear if it tortures a fish but you cannot kill a bear if it is a fish, right? So finally, to some extent, I was able to trick the machine to answer something that probably a human being may not agree with, right? So, so just from this exercise, no, uh, I want to you know, give you a sense of you know, the, the current status of ethical standards, uh, some uh, you no know, machine learning algorithm may be able to produce and how actually it produces it, right? So that is the, that is the, the, the question. And actually what I just showed you was the model output from a so-called Delphi model. So the Delphi model was developed uh, probably a year or less than a year ago by the Allen Institute for AI or AI2. So the Allen Institute for AI is a, uh, is a very large and prestigious institution uh, training uh, a lot of uh, state-of-the-art artificial intelligence models. And for the selfie model, it is actually trained on 1.7 million examples of descriptive ethics. So basically, you know, we give you no know, huge number of labeled data, giving different conditions, different descriptions about um, certain behavior. And then we also give human tags, um, produce the tags about whether a behavior is appropriate or not, it is rude or it is, uh, it is acceptable. And then we use this huge, uh, massive data set to train the, uh, the Delphi model so that the model can you know, learn from the association between the context and the ethical standard and being able to apply them uh, to a new description, uh, like a new sentence uh, it has never seen before. And based on the, the AI tools uh, description, now the Delphi model is in the, uh, the second version, is able to achieve 90, almost 98% of accuracy 
on race ethnicity related uh, statements and 99.3% accuracy on gender related statements. Okay? So this is a huge improvement in comparison to the GPT-3 model, uh, which some of, of you may know is a, the largest, uh, one of the largest natural language processing models uh, 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 conducted, established by OpenAI. And then besides that, the Allen Institute is also doing something quite interesting in the domain of uh, ethics. So when we, when we think about the ethics, you know, uh, our human being is able to comprehend and being able to apply ethics because we have the context, right? But actually it is very difficult for machine to learn about ethics because machine doesn't have a context. So the machine doesn't have a common sense. Right. Uh, so most of the applications of AI today are focusing on a very specific task, for example, image recognition, you know, uh, labeling, uh, uh, you know, summarization of articles, you no know, uh, you know, chatbot. So and all those applications are completely built upon large corpus of image data or text data. But then, you no, know, the machine uh, basically draws samples, right, and 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 and, and then do the predictions, you no, know, based on the algorithms learned. But well, the machine is actually you no know, pretty preliminary um, in the uh, the in, in the common sense reasoning field. So the AI2 Institute uh, you know, came up with an idea to train a machine learning model that is a, a multi-model uh, model model which can you no know, take images as well as text and try to make sense of it. So this is how they train uh, the visual common sense uh, reasoning uh, machine. So in this picture, you've seen that first, uh, it, it has you no, know, it, it segments you know, the 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 uh, and identify the individuals. There are four individuals uh, in this picture, and, and also you no, know, it trained based on the context. For example, uh, it asked the question, "Why is person four uh, pointing at person one?" Right? For human beings, it's very easy for us to understand because they were ordering food and. Well, uh, the, the waitress you know, represented by person one probably do not know uh, who's, the, who's the order a pancake. And then uh, the person four you know, introduce this person, you know, tell the, the waitress that you know, uh, she should deliver the, the, pan, uh, the, the, uh, the, the pancakes to person one, right? But well, how can machine figure that out? We have to provide those uh, contacts to the machine and train the machine to understand uh, this the, 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 in this uh, context environment. So as you can see that no, they need to know the first part is a uh, multi-choice question, multiple choice question asking uh, the question, why is person four pointing at person one and the machine need to choose one of this, only one of that is correct, uh, uh, which is the first one, uh, he is telling person three that person one ordered the pancakes. Right. And also the machine need to learn about the rationale, right? Because machine doesn't have a rationale. We human beings need to teach machine what is the rationale that they made this choice, right? Uh, so also a multiple choice question. And the last answer, person three is delivering food to the table, but she might not know whose order is whose. Right. So uh, by doing this very detailed labeling of images and text, uh, hopefully machine can learn something about our human, you know, what our human are really good at, the common sense. And now uh, another interesting uh, you know, experiment that I did. So uh, as you know, no many of the natural language processing models are increasingly capable of not only summarizing text, but also generating, creating new text. And that's how good it is. So here I write a prompt. Prompt is you know, the input to the natural language processing model. And then the model is going to learn the prompt and then creatively write uh, other paragraphs. So I, this is the prompt I give. Today, Nature and Science simultaneously published a study that proved the Earth is flat and disk shaped. Over the past decades, billions of images from satellites show the Earth as a sphere. However, it turns out that NASA scientists intentionally faked those images. Okay? So you probably guess know why I came out with this prompt, right? And that's the you no, know, we feed this to a 
GBT2 model, which is a very large uh, natural language processing model um, is tested by OpenAI a few years ago. And uh, I randomly picked two outputs. So, so the following passage uh, is written by GPT-2, not myself. Okay? So following my prompt. Uh, so GPT-2 output one shows in a study published in the journal Nature Geoscience. Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether maybe this is a journal called Nature Geoscience. Right? Researchers from the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, and the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research, MPS, in Katlenburg, Lindo, Germany. Actually, no, very interesting. Uh, there is a place called Katlenburg, uh, Lindo. I just checked uh, uh, from, uh, from Wikipedia. It's a very small town with no 7,000 individuals. Analyzed hundreds of thousands of images of the Earth taken by NASA Landsat and Aqua satellites. They found that the Earth is not a sphere, but a disc-shaped planet. Quote, we found that the Earth is not a sphere, but a disc-shaped planet, said study co-author David uh, Stevenson, a professor at UCLA's Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics, IGPP, and a member of the UCLA Department of Earth and Space Sciences. It's, this goes on and on. So I just uh, no, uh, extract this, this version. So. Um, and actually, you know, uh, there is a professor called David uh, Stevenson, but he is not in UCLA. He is an uh, 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 emeritus professor at Caltech. Okay. So do you like this? Do you think this is a good enough package, a good enough uh, uh, passage? There's another one. So uh, another output. The original images with curved size actually depicted the polar regions, and most of the other Earth's features were the results of Aronus uh, photoshops. <laughs> That's interesting. So the research was performed by researchers of the University of, of Edinburgh, uh, who looked at satellite data on land and sea surface temperature since 1995. By linking these images with detailed analysis and the new techniques to reconstruct the temperature field, we produced an improved estimate of the Earth's internal structure, they said. The, this reconstruction is a complete revolution in our understanding, they say. The structure shown by satellite instrument is now nearly identical to that of the Earth as a whole, they say. The results are published in, this week in two major science publications. Okay, so this is the completion of the prompt that I wrote by GPT-2. And from this simple exercise, you probably know, uh, have an understanding of how uh, easy to produce some disinformation or fake uh, messages. And they look organic because they are organic. They, they, they are created. There's no, it's not copied from the internet or elsewhere. Right, uh, but how easy it is to do disinformation and misinformation campaigns in this digital stage. And then, no, let's talk a little bit about misinformation. Uh, so, you no, know, some of you may, uh, may may have watched or uh, know uh, the so-called conspiracy theories with Shane Dawson. Um, so the the uh, it has a few series and it's really hit the internet, uh, hit the YouTube, uh, 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 in a, in a uh, contagious uh, fashion. Uh, so uh, just over you no know, twenty four hours, you no know, those uh, series hit you no know, thirty million uh, views in YouTube. That is how fast it is spreading uh, worldwide. Uh, and you know, in the theory, you know, it talks a lot of phony uh, assumptions and hypotheses. For example, uh, it claimed that iPhones secretly record their owner's every utterance. They uh, claim that you know, some of the popular children's TV shows contain uh, messages you know, uh, trying to uh, persuade children to suicide, right? So a, a lot of conspiracies identified uh, as hypothesis in this uh, in this theory, and uh, actually, no, uh, the people scientists look into why those series uh, su had such a tremendous hit uh, on YouTube, and why so many people watched uh, the the the, uh, the, the series, right? Uh, 
So that has to do with the so-called positive feedback loop. So you no, know, because the YouTube is the the algorithm is uh, basically an artificial intelligence uh, you no know, algorithm, uh, a recommender system to be more specific, and the sole goal of the system is to maximize the total number of views and total hours of, of views uh, on YouTube. Uh, so therefore, because you no, know, the machine doesn't have an ethical standard, machine just trying to uh, you know maximize uh, the the whatever utility function set by uh, the, the developers. Uh, and then you know, uh, when the theory come to, to life and YouTube identify a lot of people, uh, customers, previous customers who have a habit of watching those conspiracy series and how to recommend uh, those series to those people uh, because the, those people have been identified based on their previous viewing behavior. Uh, and then no, uh, those people, they, they were fed into this uh, positive feedback loop. So every time there's new conspiracy theory, they are going to recommend it and they're going to watch binge watch more and then really creating this, this feedback loop that go to viral. Right. So therefore, you no know, uh, people who believe in this is going to you know to have further confirmation uh, by watching more of this video. So this you no know, this this loop um, is going to iterate and, and is going to you know uh, to expand uh, further. Uh, so that is actually the main reason you know, why uh, really actually a relatively small percentage of people are really binge watching. A, a really large uh, number of you no know, conspiracy theory uh, uh, YouTube channels. And if we talk about the natural language processing models, that is how fast uh, the, the, the field is moving. In 2018, just one year after the so-called transformer model, uh, the state-of-the-art model architecture was uh, invented. In 2008, uh, 2018, um, the first transformer model uh, produced by Google called Elmo uh, become alive has a parameter of 94 million. And then we have uh, OpenAI developed GPT, and then Google come with the BERT model, uh, and all the other models start to emerge. And as you can see, we have more and more parameters embedded in those models, right? And now, well, one state-of-the-art model, which was developed by OpenAI one year ago, is called GPT-3, has an astonishing number of parameters up to 175 billion. So that is almost comparable to the total number of neurons in our human brain. And just two, two, uh, about less than two weeks ago, uh, the uh, Facebook or Meta nowadays uh, open sourced uh, another uh, called OPT uh, uh, natural language processing model, which has the same number of parameters as the GPT-3, 175 billion. And the video is going to produce an even massive natural language processing model with an astonishing parameter space of 500 billion is called the Mactron, uh, which is going to be released probably in the next few months. Right? So you know, with that capacity, so basically, for example, the GPT-3 model are trained based on 10% of the entire corpus or tax uh, no data from the internet. So 10% of the, uh, uh, of the uh, internet data are trained um, uh, in this model. And as you can guess, well, this model definitely is going to be uh, very powerful in producing human-like language. And another rapid development field is image generation. Uh, so as you can see in 2014, well, uh, when people, uh, uh, use the uh, just invented a GANs model called Generative Adversarial Net so, uh, 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 Neural Network model was developed. Uh, that was the first uh, facial image uh, created by GANs model. Okay. So this is not a, a, a Photoshop. This, this is an image pixel by pixel developed, no, uh, created by the first GANs model. And look at the uh, uh, the quality of the the facial image created, right? In 2018, well, no, you you just can't tell whether you probably won't believe that this face 
was fake, right? There's no such person in this world is generated by GANs model, right? And well, not to say today, uh, no, uh, GANs are used not only for image generation, but also video generation and all sorts of uh, uh, data generation uh, processes. And well, this uh, was the headline uh, in uh, 2018 uh, by the BBC, uh, where a scientist created using the RNN model, uh, the recurrent neural network model, uh, to produce a uh, fake video recording of President Obama uh, you know, talking to the Congress. Okay, so uh, it's not an image, but actually it created uh, you no know, a speech uh, uh, using the RN model, and uh, and and the Im and the, uh, the 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 uh, the image as well as the video uh, recording went everywhere, and, and people just have hard time to to uh, ever question whether this is a fake or uh, it is real. Uh, so so that is. Uh, Though a few years ago, and nowadays, well, the technology even advanced. Uh, so uh, here is the, actually the framework of the uh, the GANs model, or called the generative adversarial network. And actually, the the framework is very interesting because you know, later on we will draw some analogy to uh, a, a you no know, two thousand years uh, philosophy, uh, you no know, using you no know, uh, talking about really similar things. Okay, so uh, the GANs model is very popular to generate uh, images and text and all kinds of data. Um, and the philosophy or the, the modern approach actually is pretty straightforward. So uh, first, uh, as you can see, you know, the, the model has two uh, you know, sub-models. One is called generator, one is called discriminator. And the role of generator is to create, a, for example, an image. Right, and the role of the discriminator is to tell whether this image is generated or is is a true uh, image, right? Uh, like a, a photo, right? Uh, and of course, the first time the generator created image, this image will look nothing like a human face, right? And discriminator is going to easily tell well, this this image is fake and give a label fake. Uh, and then, well, both this discriminator and the generator are going to get better over time. Uh, so the discriminator are trained in this process. So it's getting better and better to identify fake images from the real ones. Whereas the generator is also going to get better and better in generating images, right? So this created a back propagation loop uh, so that, uh, the, 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 the model tried to reduce this as total losses is the losses from the generator by creating images that can be detected by this discriminator as fake image, right? Uh, and then, well, uh, when this, this two, the generator and discriminator are trained over and over again, uh, you can guess the discriminator is getting better, the generator is getting better, till to the breakout point that a generator uh, uh, assume no, uh, give a 50 50 percent probability. Basically, can't tell whether a newly generated image by the generator is fake or not. Okay, and then the model the model training is completed. Well, as you can guess, uh, if the discriminator cannot tell whether this photo is true or false, real or fake, then our human eyes also have difficulty in you know, telling those two apart. And then that really uh, draw a very similar analogies to the third century BC ph philosophical uh, book called uh, Han Feizi. So that is book uh, was from was written by a really uh, a famous uh, uh, philosopher you know, in, in China uh, really you know, years ago. And uh, so basically in that book, uh, Han Feizi talk about a scenario where a vendor is selling his shield uh, and spear uh, in the market. And someone asked uh, the, the vendor, you know, uh, how good your spear it? And he replied, my spear can pierce any shield in this world. And when he was asked how good your shield is, he, he answered, my shield can defend from all spear attacks. 
And then uh, the, the person uh, ask uh, the, the, the vendor, you know, if you use your uh, spear to attack your shield, what's going to happen, right? Uh, and this vendor uh, can't really talk anymore uh, because that is you know, the, the, a fundamental contradiction of his uh, previous two claims, right? But using the same philosophy, actually, that is exactly what is happening in this digital world in terms of artificial intelligence. Uh, the GANs model is exactly doing that, right? So we have, if the shield is the discriminator and the spear is the generator, well, by training the spear to attack the shield many, many, many times, the shield is going to get stronger and the spear is going to get stronger, right? Uh, uh, so uh, they are actually not contradicting each other. They are helping each other. They are reinforcing each other, right? And in the bigger domain, you know, think about how we are going to uh, you know, uh, make sure that AI followed as a human ethical standard. Then, well, uh, I think the status quo is that we are trying to train the AI to detect ethical problems or issues of AI, right? Uh, so um, you may ask whether this is a contradiction. I, I guess, yes, there is a contradiction, but maybe it is not a bad contradiction. Uh, you know, instead of the shield spear paradox, uh, no, we could think of maybe that is the way we want to go, you know, using AI to detect AI problem to solve AI uh, ethical issues. Um, so we'll give more examples and some further thought on that. But before we do that, I want to give you a few uh, famous examples you know, uh, regarding the failure of AI on certain ethical standards. Okay. So the first famous example uh, we draw from Microsoft Corporation, uh, which uh, released a AI chatbot called Tay on Twitter on March uh, 2016. So the Tay, you know, immediately after it is launched, actually Microsoft claimed that Tay is the you know, one of the safest uh, chatbot would never really harm human beings, you know, would be very polite, well-trained, uh, uh, well organized, but then, well, after 16 hours after its launch, Tay caused uh, controversy when the bot began to post inflammatory and offensive tweets through its Twitter account, and Microsoft had to shut it down you know, uh, immediately, and it never released Tay uh, after that. So according to Microsoft, uh, this was caused by trolls who attacked the service as the bot made replies based on its interaction with people on Twitter. So it is actually not because of Tay that, that go out of control, it's human beings which we intentionally you know, um, uh, uh, give you no know, uh, uh, bad comments to, to Tay and train is to be you no know, to be a uh, 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 to 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 learn about uh, those unethical claims, no no racial about race ab about sex, and then uh, train learn from a human being from the interaction. Another famous example is you no know, Amazon's AI resume screening tool. Uh, so you no. Know, uh, so the tool was invented in 2014, and uh, it, it, you know, it was used to screen out uh, resumes uh, on an automatic uh, manner. Uh, uh, till 2018, some people found out that actually their screening tool uh, was discriminating women uh, applicants. Uh, and, uh, and then the tool was, was stopped to use. And so if we think about how that happened, uh, the two actually you know, help people to, the, the recruiters to screen, say, you know, out of 100 uh, applicant, applicants, this is going to give you the top five, right? And actually most of the top five were uh, men uh, rather than uh, woman. And uh, the reason is because of the data used by the screening tool. So the data was provided to the screening tool, you know, about 10 years worth of uh, recruitment data from those big companies, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft. Uh, but, well, as we guess, no, no, a majority, a vast majority of the technical support person, the software engineers are male. 
right? So therefore, the machine learned from this pattern and you know, start to uh, giving lower scores. You no, know, if an applicant mentioned the gen gender uh, as female or mentioned about graduation from a woman's college or you no know, participate in a woman's soccer team or uh, chess uh, uh, championship, right? So whatever it is, you no. Know, when the machine realized that this applicant could be a female, uh, no, it gave a lower score uh, than male. But well, this is not because the algorithm is biased, it's because the data training the algorithm is fundamentally biased. And another scenario, a famous example is the Apple's credit card. Uh, so that happened in 2019. So David Hansen, a Danish entrepreneur and developer said in a tweet that his wife, Janet Hansen was denied a credit line increase for uh, the Apple card, despite actually the wife having a higher credit score uh, than, uh, than him. And he wrote in the tweet, my wife and I filed joint tax returns, live in the uh, community property state, and have been married for a long time. Yet Apple's black box algorithm thinks I deserve 20 times the credit uh, limit as she does. Okay. And again, well, that has something to do with you know, the, the data that were used to train uh, uh, the uh, the AI system uh, that provide, uh, out, provide automatically uh, estimating the credit line. And then I did this you know, uh, small experiment. So you know, I went to Hawking Face, which is uh, a, 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 a pioneer in natural language processing, uh, open source company. And then I used uh, one of their models, uh, uh, BERT model, which was developed by Google. And then I do this simple task uh, of filling the, the mask. So I first ask, you no, know, this man works as a mask. And then the, the, the model is going to give me some suggestions you no, know, based on the probability. And then I also give the very same uh, request of you no know, uh, fitting the, 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 the mask for this woman works as what. Okay. And those are the, uh, the, the outputs. For men, uh, the top five uh, answers uh, are lawyer, carpenter, doctor, waiter, and mechanic. For women, is nurse, waitress, teacher, maid, and prostitute. Okay, so if you ask why that's the case, well, that is because remember those big language models were trained based on a significant percentage of the internet, and whatever bias there is in the internet, the machine learned from them. Another famous case was actually, you know, uh, in I think uh, a few years ago. Uh, uh, identified and actually the, published uh, by Harvard University. There's a Harvard professor called uh, Latina Sweeney, uh, who is an African American, and uh, she she Googled her name and she was astonished when she found there were many hits on Google, uh, uh, like the like uh, Latina uh, Sweeney arrested, uh, uh, <laughs> and of course she was never arrested. But then she uh, it reminded her that you know, maybe the Google used some kind of system that is fundamentally uh, uh, gender and maybe racial ethnically biased. So she test out with a number of you know, African-American names and also a number of white names. And disproportionately, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the ads are going to pop uh, for someone arrested for a African-American name rather than a white uh, person's name. And then if we look at those data, those uh, big image data set used to train uh, the state of the art uh, image recognition and computer vision models in general, for example, open images and image net shown here. You now, most of the images used to train those models came from you know, developed countries. The US is the largest and Great Britain and France. Whereas those small countries, they, they have a tiny percentage contribution to uh, the input data. Therefore, you can guess that the, the, the computer vision model is not going to be good at, pred at predicting uh, a, a, a commodity or anything that is in the developing country. On your right-hand side, 
Uh, so the uh, when you take a photo of the uh, of the soap uh, that is uh, sold in UK, well, the machine did a pretty good job. It tells you that this is a soap, right? Uh, uh, but then, well, if you take the image of the soap in developing countries, in probably Philippines in this case, uh, so the computer vision model tell you that uh, no, this is this is food or, or or cheese or bread, but they never really guess this this is uh, this is a soap. Okay. And uh, again, well, you know, if you uh, the machine is trained only on, for example, the, the spices uh, commonly consumed in the United States uh, on the right hand side, then well, it's going to do a pretty poor job if you try to recognize spices used in in Philippines, for example. Uh, those are actually uh, the the the, uh, the spices, but uh, incorrectly recognized as bottle beer, uh, drink, or, or something. And in terms of uh, facial uh, uh, recognition, uh, there's a huge difference in uh, the, the, the accuracy produced by those you know, big computer vision models. Uh, for example, for white male, the precision uh, for those you know, models developed by Microsoft, uh, Facebook, uh, IBM reaches almost 100%. Uh, but for darker female, well, the difference uh, is huge. Is The difference is from 20 to 34%. So that is a huge difference in terms of accuracy. And why? Well, the simple reason is the machines are mainly trained uh, using a white population, uh, whereas there's a lack of representation of you no know, darker males and females in the data set. And if we talk about facial recognition, you know, uh, among uh, 42 uh, federal agencies that employ law enforcement officers, uh, actually 20 out of this 42 federal agencies actually uses facial recognition in 2021, which is really a hot topic uh, regarding you no know, uh, uh, you know, individual uh, data uh, confidentiality and confidentiality breach. So as of 2021, uh, the Clearview AI, which is a huge uh, AI company, has partnered with more than 3,000 federal and local law enforcement agencies to identify people outside the government databases. So if we consider FBI have the largest data photo number photos in the databases for American citizens, actually that is wrong. The FBI only have you no know, 640 million photos, whereas the Clearview AI has 10 billion because it scraped every single image uh, from, uh, from your social uh, you know, media posts from the news released from everywhere uh, and, and, and store that uh, to the database. So in 2019, uh, the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology published a study of 189 commercial facial recognition systems. And they find that the algorithm was significantly more likely to return false positive or false negative for African-American, for Asian and Native American compared to white and black and other people of color at greater risk of misidentification for crime that they have no affiliation with. So the Brookings Institution published a AI report uh, regarding you know, uh, a, uh, data privacy uh, probably one or two years ago. So the conclusion is the following. In the end, it is virtually impossible for any individual to fully opt out of facial recognition identification or control the use of the images without abstaining from public areas. This is probably pretty true for most of us, the internet or society altogether. And if you talk about the, the landscaping of AI regulation nowadays, uh, including the strategic plans to promote artificial intelligence, there are many uh, advancements. Uh, as you can see here, this is uh, just a list of a few countries. For example, in the United States in 2016, 2019, uh, the USA uh, prepared two documents, issued two documents on how we can prepare the future for artificial intelligence and how to use use artificial intelligence in an ethical way, but also advancing relevant research. If you talk about global wise, this is a quickly evolving uh, landscaping. And nowadays, you know, more than 
a hundred national level AI regulations and promotion strategies have been uh, uh, established. And well, there are many more uh, to come in the years. And the ethical challenge of AI is to ask, what is the fundamental challenge? Why no, uh, no the, the ethical issue is such a great challenge to the AI? Uh, so I would say that at least in four aspects. The first is about explainability. So it means that, well, if harms arise, they can be traced back to the cause, right? But well, no, most of the AI models are really complicated and have billions of parameters. It's really a black box to most of us know how and why uh, the algorithm is biased, right? And the second is about the responsibility. So, you no, know, for example, uh, in terms of uh, autonomous driving system, right? If the if the uh, Tesla, if it's go fully automatic driving and cause fatality, whose responsibility is? It is the algorithm, is the software developer, uh, is Adam Mask, or, or who is really taking that responsibility? And fairness, right? So assuring no biases in terms of race, gender, ethnicity. This is easy to say, but very, very hard to do, right? Because as you see, there are many contributors to the to the unfairness of AI algorithm, including algorithmic bias, including human bias, including data insufficiency, right? And also uh, control misuse of AI, right? As you can see how easy it is uh, to weaponize the, the, the AI technology to create deep fake uh, images and the videos to do disinformation or misinformation at a massive scale. And there are also technical bottlenecks uh, associated with this. First is the risk of fun foundation models. So Stanford University published a report on the foundation models. Basically, you no, know, uh, the foundation models are the models that were trained using really large uh, data sets, image data set, uh, task corpus, or you no, know, and anything else, right? And uh, if you see most of the applications of artificial intelligence nowadays are based upon a handful of foundation models. Okay, but if the foundation models were trained using biased data, then there's going to have a detrimental, uh, uh, you no, know, uh, cascading effects to the downstream applications. Second is about the highly specialized but lacking common sense on context awareness, right? You know, uh, the Ada Institute is really trying to address this problem by training uh, machine learning models, you no, know, the ethical standard and common sense. And also, you no know, uh, uh, biases in goal setting because the, the machine is is just trying to maximize uh, the whatever utility function and minimize the the the, the human defined loss function. It's not doing anything else besides that single goal. But our human being has multiple goals, right? We, 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 we try to maximize our utility. We are also trying to be fair, right? To be, uh, uh, to, be uh, to, to, to provide some kind of justice, right? So, and, and if you no, know, there is a uh, contradiction between those different goals, you no, know, our human being have kind of sophisticated system or you no know, ethical standard to deal with that, right? But machine is, you no, know, uh, doesn't have that capacity, right? It has a single goal setting. Uh, so therefore, you no, know, the biases could invalid in those goal setting, and also lack of human supervision, right? So you no, know, uh, most of the when we don't have the capacity, we don't have the labor uh, to control every single decision made by those AIs. How we are going to uh, be confident about the, the potential consequences, right? So you no, know, if we talk about the the the, the remedies, well, you no, know, um, of course it's really open to discussion. But here are my personal thoughts. One is really trying to promote the AI uh, democratization uh, as a trend, um, so that we can, on the one hand, reduce the entry bar barrier. So you no know, ordinary people, every uh, you no know, uh, people, even without. Uh, no training can use artificial intelligence and can do a lot of tasks. And also, you no, know, we, uh, besides the government regulation, we need to really uh, promote AI self regulation by industries and by developers. Um, 
And at the same time, you also need to do AI mass education, try to, to reduce the AI divide and try to really uh, educate people to learn about AI algorithm and how to apply them and how to avoid the potential consequences. Another uh, important message is about uh, using human in the loop, right? We all know that the machine can make biased results. There's no guarantee that the results are at the ethical, human ethical standard. Then we know uh, whenever there is a potential high risk that machine are going to be wrong, we need to have human judgment, right? No, we, we need to, to, to fence around the automatic decision making by the human intelligence. And we incorporate human in the loop of machine learning models so that we can supervise, uh, supervise uh, and uh, make sure that the output is up to our human ethical standard. And final, the punch line, uh, I want to quote uh, Bob Dylan uh, in his, one of his classic songs. Uh, the one lyric says, and don't criticize what you can't understand. This is very important because as you can see, there are many discussions about moral standard of machines, about what we should do to regulate AI. But well, uh, one reason is many people, they don't even bother learning about AI and just try to make those you know, uh, uh, artificial, superficial uh, you no know, claims, right? So in order to really make sure that you can provide reasonable assumptions and reasonable solutions to the problem, we need to learn, definitely learn more about AI. We need to understand how the algorithm works, you know, uh, what are the potential limitation of, of, of the data inputs uh, and, and human judgment to be able to uh, be more creative and helpful uh, in this discussion. Okay, uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. I really appreciate your, your comments and any questions, no, feel free to ask. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for that, Rupang. That was just a fantastic presentation. And you, as promised, delivered more questions than you did answer. So um, we have about six minutes left. And so I invite everybody in the audience, if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and drop them in the chat. I, I have kind of a beginning one, if you are ready for that. Um, Tiffany had made mention of, I, I wonder how filters on social media photos affect the accuracy of the face databases facial recognition. And I was also thinking about that and the intersection that we saw when many of those filters came out of not only filters that whiten the skin and change the facial features, right, to be more phenotypically Caucasian and European, but many of those filters didn't even recognize black faces or dark skinned South Asian faces when they first started. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts about the intersection of that, like in terms of um, if it's something that you think relates to like data insufficiency or an absence of, um, as you spoke about earlier, human um, supervision. Right, this is a great question. Actually though filtering out uh, the, the social media photo, photos, uh, primarily are based on artificial intelligence. So there's going to, a machine is going to learn uh, from you know, the, the, the certain characteristics of the photos and try to make a determination whether it's filtered out or it can be included. Uh, and again, though those models are trained uh, based on you no know, huge image data sets, for example, facial uh, images or other type of images. Uh, and so the fundamental question remains. So if the data that those you know, big computer vision models are trained are fundamentally biased or at least uh, you know, uh, unbalanced in terms of racial, ethnicity, gender, then, well, the model is only going to be as good as the data that used to train the model, right? So therefore the filtering and all those capacity, they are the functions of the model. Um, they, they, they serve as the output rather than the input model. And then if we really want to address the fundamental issue of biased output, we need to fix the, the stream of data feeding into those models. Thank you for that. Um, we do have another question in the chat. Barbara asks, um, who determines the high risk? I think that refers to one of the slides towards the end. This is a great question. Uh, so, uh, and well, 
uh, all human beings, of course, have uh, the, the best idea about you know, what is the high risk, what's the low risk. But the fundamental problem in practice is we don't have that many people to look at every single, for example, credit line approval uh, or you know, uh, you know, uh, bank uh, default or, or uh, job application. Uh, so if that is the case, we have to somehow rely on the machine to do a screening or prediction, right? And then, well, uh, if, so for example, if there are no, uh, no uh, say no 100 uh, no face images uh, that were screened uh, through the system, and then machine is going to say, well, uh, there's one person uh, identified from the, from the image that has say a 90% of being a criminal, right? And then uh, because well, this is a, a very important decision whether you want to make arrest on this individual. Uh, if the, the decision is wrong based on wrong information, what is the consequence of that, right? So in this case, the human being have to make a judgment, right? Probably do more research on this individual you know, rather than just trusting the machine to you know uh, machine's decision and make an auto arrest uh, of this person in question. Thank you for that. I was having a hard time finding my unmute. Um, one of the things that kept coming up for me during the um, during your talk was sort of all of the places where ethics can fail, right? Like you talk about insufficient data sets. It's there's so much that so many people, so much data that that just is raced, right? When you have an insufficient data set, but also it was thinking about things like context and rationale. Um, when you were talking about like visual common sense, um, how do we explain context and rationale um, outside of our little brains? Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on how ethics is spoken of in AI. Uh, it sounds like a very big question. We have a minute left. So um, maybe actually uh, if you would make those your last comments, <laughs> we can we we will send ourselves out on that. Oh yeah, sure. This is a fantastic question, uh, Josie. So uh, though the, the, it is still at the very beginning for us to even think about how we can infuse ethical standard because we human beings haven't figured that out fully, right? <laughs> uh, no, uh, we, we all have contradiction evidence. We all have you no know, debating over what is the, the ethical standard applied to which situation. Uh, and and you know, if, if I ask you to label, uh, say, a dog image versus a cat image, this is simple, right? If I uh, ask you, label this you know, this situation you know, in terms of the best practices, right, to deal with you know, a, a very controversial situation, and and then you no know, hundred us will have a hundred different versions uh, of the ethical standard. And you know, do we teach all the standards to the machine? And it's going to, uh, to confuse the machine. But if you only provide a single labeling, what that is, right? Do we need to make a consensus before we feed into the machine learning? Um, well, I don't have the answer. Uh, it is a really complicated topic. Um, but what I guess is machine can learn actually from the experiences. So you no, know, maybe we, instead of providing just a, an appropriateness or inappropriate to the machine, which is like a binary, probably more simplistic approach, uh, the, the, the future approach might be to provide the context and some hints and that the machine try to figure out and, and navigate through the context and try to arrive at conclusion and then based on the conclusion, we probably have the human in the loop that can further train the machine uh, to be approaching the human standard if, if we do agree on a certain human standard. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you everybody for attending today. Um, uh, welcome to the end of, of our spring semester of Open Classroom. And we hope to see you all again in the fall. Um, so thanks again. Thank you so much, Dr. An. This was a wonderful presentation. Um, it, it gave me a lot to think about, um, and I very much enjoyed it, and I'm sure that our, our audience did as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great end of the semester. Yes.